Oh, we're just plain shy. That's all there is to it. All right. Well, uh, before we start this morning, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer, okay? Our Father who art in heaven, again, uh, we come boldly before the throne of grace, not because of confidence in ourselves, but because of confidence in you. And we pray this morning, what a, what a privilege to actually come before you and uh, the, the whole universe and being at the throne of grace and uh, being able to have a normal conversation. I mean, I, Lord, we're thankful for that. Certainly we're undeserving, but we know that you are, and we know that you paid the price for that. And our lesson today will cover that. So we pray for the Holy Spirit to be with us, and we ask it in Jesus' name, and for his sake, amen. All right, well, good morning, and uh, you know, we got one more week in Isaiah. How many have enjoyed this study of Isaiah? And uh, <clears throat> I think that, uh, you know, it's an interesting book, because you look at the first 40 chapters, and it's kind of a downer, isn't it? Uh, you know, you, if, if you just stuck with a 40, uh, I don't know, we probably wouldn't have anybody here. But it was necessary because God's concerned when we separate from him. And we're going to talk about that in length today. And we're going to talk, in, uh, we'll be in Isaiah 53, Isaiah 61, Isaiah 58, and Isaiah 59, and so forth. So anyway, we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. And... Uh, we're going to talk about Isaiah 58, verse 3. We've talked about this all before. And it's really like the church saying to God, you know, we're doing all these things for you. You know, we fast, we go to church on Sabbath, we do all of these things. Why do you not say? Why do you not listen? Why do you not hear? All right, how would you take that in today's age? Is the church sometimes a cover for our deficiencies in our relationship with God? What do you think? Can we use the church as a cover? Uh-oh. See, I see a smile on her face saying, guilty as charged. <laughs> Is that right? We're all guilty as charged. Is that right? What did you say, Mark? Yes. Now, uh, who is brave enough? Because if you don't answer this question, then I have to answer it. And I'd rather have, you know, you guys tell me about your faults rather than me talk about mine uh, and so forth. So how many of you have felt that at times you've used your outward actions and display to cover, if you don't uh, know sin, issues in your life that you know you need to approach God with? Anybody been in that position before? I have. Okay, that didn't seem to open it up at all, but uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. And I say that from this perspective. Um, I don't think over the last, well, recently, and I could be wrong, sometimes those who observe us are in a better position to give us an answer than we are personally. Wouldn't you not agree sometimes? You know, in employment, how many of you are supervisors in your position? A manager, whatever. Okay, have you ever asked... In your case, you have the faculty, students, to grade your performance. You have, okay? And uh, now, now you're frowning. <laughs> I don't like that idea. You didn't, oh, she's a teacher. Oh, oh well, he oh, is a, you're a principal, right? But no, but, but I've been a teacher, and they required us at the end of every year to have students review. Grade you. Okay, really good. Okay, Ron, you didn't tell me your wife's name. Margo. M-A-R-G-O. Margo. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, Margo. You know, I think of Margo, I think when I was a kid and we didn't have television and we'd listen to radio and Mother would be very careful about what we listened to. I had gang bosses on and she walked into the room and the radio was destroyed uh, and so forth. But Margo Lane strikes a... Anybody ever heard that name? Yes, the shadow. Yeah, there's another guy with me who was listening to radio back in 1947. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the shadow, right? Name association. So now, now I've got, now when I think of Margo, I think of the shadow. So usually name association works for me, I reverse it. So it doesn't work that well. But uh, anyway, well, let's get back to the a Seventh day Adventist. And uh, I think most of us, probably, if not all of us, believe that if, if not a denomination, it is certainly. It certainly is a movement within Christianity. Would you agree? And so forth. 
And uh, how is it possible that we, again, and I gave a you know, kind of a brief example of that, how is it possible to use the church as a cover? This is a, uh, before we move to point number two, <laughs> we got to cover this ground. What do you think? Okay, now, uh, this was an issue that Jesus had with the Pharisees, not true? In fact, he had with the whole hierarchy of the Jewish religion. Is that not true? It was too external based. Now, is it wrong to concentrate on outward activity? Okay. All right, you want to, Ron, you want to enlarge that a little bit or embellish that? Okay, taken right out of George Knight's book, Sin and Salvation. That is exactly what he says, and so forth. And that's basically what scripture says. But is, is it sometimes a facade or a, a cliche that we say, well, we believe that we're righteous because of God's righteousness. It's a legal righteousness. Doesn't mean that we're righteous per se. It means that God says you're righteous. Okay, right? And so forth. Then we say, well, we're commandment keepers, because that's what the Bible says. And that's where, not only in Adventism, that's where there has been discussion for multitudes of years, probably since the fall of Adam, right? How does that work? Well, let's give an example. I worked for my father since I was seven years old. He was a custodian. I didn't have an education above eighth grade, but he had common sense, which we're lacking today. Uh, and so forth. And, uh, you know, he made this kind of a statement. Some of you have already heard this. One day, uh, he said to me, you need to remember, son, an eighth grade graduate. He says, wisdom and knowledge do not always walk hand in hand. Guy's got a PhD. <laughs> Forget that high school diploma, that eighth grade diploma. But the thing is, it's true, and so forth. But, you know, I worked with my dad all the time. And my mother was kind of, you know, the leader in the family, not my dad. He was very quiet, rarely said anything. And I worked with him all the time. And when I, he, I did something wrong, he'd say, it doesn't really look that good. If I'm sweeping a floor or whatever, he'd say, and that was like he took a ton of bricks and threw it on me. I wanted to please him so bad. And that helps me to understand what it means that when we love God, and as we're moving toward that point, because that's part of sanctification, right? We'll be more and more motivated to do his will, because we don't want to disappoint him. What a way to serve God, isn't it? And this is the problem we have here. And let's take a, a, a statement that we've read before. Let's take a look at this. Ellen White talks about, in the book, uh, Prophets and Kings, what the attitude of God's people were. Now, let's see if it matches some of us. In Isaiah's day, the spiritual understanding of mankind was dark through misapprehension of God. Long had Satan sought to lead men to look upon their creator as the author of suffering and death. Where would anybody get that? Have you ever heard anybody said, you know what, the way the world is right, it's God's fault. And you come back to, well, why is that? Well, isn't he, doesn't he control the universe? Doesn't he have control over everything? Then why do we have sin? It's his fault. How would you answer that? Get another Bible study. Part, that's, that's number one on a, on a four-part multiple-choice question. We'll just forget this guy. We'll try somebody else, okay? You're huh. coming to the edge of, of the great sea of knowledge and wisdom in the grave controversy to explain the, where it originated from. And do it in two sentences. <laughs> What about this? In a sense, when we say God is responsible, it could be partially true. There's one reason that sin came into this world. It's because God gave his beings the, the ability to what? 
Choose. Now, why would he do that? Okay. You can't love someone if you're forced or coerced to do it. Is that true? How about three wives? I said that one time at a big group, and three wives raised their hand for comment and so forth. Fortunately, we didn't call on them. But uh, anyway, being facetious. But the thing is, is that when we think about that, God knew the end result of choice. But it was that important to him that you and I choose him. Now, let's go back real quick about sin in itself. It says, because of the sin of one man, which was Adam, sin spread to some men. How, what choice did you have in that? None. So, heavy consequence. But then it says, because of the righteousness of one man, Jesus, righteousness spread to who? All men. Now, if we just took that in that context with the first verse, we'd say, then everybody's righteous. Right? If that's the only two verses you had, justice would say, okay, that's, that's okay. But then we read John 3, 16. And other texts in the Bible, we find out that not quite right. God wants you to accept his gift. And we think, how would anybody not want to accept the gift? It is free, right? To be declared righteous, who would not want that? A question for the generations, right? So we involve that thing and this situation, and this is the same offer that is being made to the Israel and Judea in Isaiah's day. Same thing. All right, let's go on. Now, this text in Isaiah is, ask, is actually answering the question in two parts of 58.3. Why, when we've done all these things, is your hand too short to save? Isaiah says, okay, part one. What does he say? Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Okay, he says God's there. He will hear, he will listen. That's the first part. That's an encouraging thing. Isn't that right? Do you believe this text? Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What in the world does that mean? Well, the author, as we uh, said that verse, implies a couple of rhetorical questions. Okay. In fact, I have that question, Ron. Okay, <laughs> no, that's all right. Go ahead and embellish. Then we'll just critique your answer when we get to it. How's that? Uh, <laughs> we're just trusting that uh, he does all the time, even though I don't get it when I want it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, hold that and think about that. There's another thing. And the problem, and I... I it's not just Adventists. When I went we for my wife is, is, has a background in another denomination who had righteous by faith, absolutely correct. She came into the Adventist church, and some people had a opinion on that subject that was completely different from hers. And it came to this text. And, uh, and that isn't just true of Adventists. Southern Baptist, I don't care if you're a Methodist, whatever. You know, the idea of grace is tough to apprehend and tough to embrace because it's too much for what we pay, which is nothing. And it's hard for us to accept that. Isn't that true? And so forth. And so God says, you know what? Before you can walk in the family of God, you've got to be part of the family of God. Make sense? And so as we've talked before, you got to get rid of that guilt complex because it will never work if you're trying to witness about my love and concern. Would you agree with that? Amen. You need to have that erased. And you can't do it, so I will. And we say, that's too much. You ever given a gift back? I did once. I really don't want to admit that uh, because it wasn't the right thing to do. But and just like, like it is and with us, is to give the gift back. Um, we'll take that. I'm too proud, right? And so forth. So 
What's it like if you and I have the testimony in our life that says there is no condemnation to you? And you really believe that. What would be our testimony? We would be saying hallelujahs all the time, right? Some people, you know, feel, well, you know, then that's going to lead to disobedience. Really? Not really. Not if you really believe it. Not if you really accept it by faith, right? It will lead to something else. A relationship with God that leads to what you asked and Bron and others that we will build that love relationship like I had for my father in order to please him. I wasn't worried about being kicked out. I wasn't worried about being thrown out of the family. I wasn't worried if he was looking in every corner to see. As I grew as a young man, I learned the things that he wanted done when he didn't. And I was motivated because I cared. And that's where we want to be. Isn't that right? Maturity is learning to care and learning to understand God. And that's why we make mistakes. That's why we sin at times. Faith doesn't grasp its full potential in a couple of minutes. Isn't that right? Everybody agree with that? Faith and maturing in faith. Sanctification is growing in Jesus. He doesn't want you worrying about judgment. He wants you to be concerned about being attached. Isn't that right? That's what faith is. Paul says, stop fighting the battle of sin and be involved with the battle of faith. That's a winner, the other is a loser. Okay, let's go on. Okay? But in this relationship that God has drawn me to as my faith, our faith grows. Yep. It's our relationship. And he just doesn't say, I'll let it pass. No. He wants me to respond and grow to the next step. And it's like when the relationship between a man and a wife is greatly on the cusp of of death and destruction because of my alcoholism. That's destroying my family. It will eventually destroy. to help me get, uh, get over that. Of his grace, the power that he gives, that he gives to overcome that. But there's a definite problem. Yes, there is. And we yeah. can't just say to sin, ah, don't worry about it. We should. Yeah. But Jesus doesn't say that in his conversion. I agree with you 100%. He doesn't say that when you accept him, and you accept his grace and his perfection, what he's trying to tell us is that in order to get involved in the family, you've got to be part of the family. Too often, we learn the doctrine of the church. Of course, salvation by faith is a doctrine. But we are always focused on making sure externally that we're doing what God wants us to do. It takes our mind away from focusing on what he's done for us now. Now, to get to his point, let's go. In fact, I could, you could have let it out better. I couldn't have written the script out because of what you're saying is the next slide. Here's the second answer or second response Isaiah gives to the question, why are you not saving us? Why are you not intervening for us? First part is God can do anything. His arm is not so short that he can't rescue you. Then here's the second part. But your iniquities have separated you from God your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Now, let's go back to the alcoholism situation. Ron's got this alcohol problem. And if you're an alcoholic, I'll tell you, without help, it's pretty much impossible. I was in a number of those of the, uh, what was it, the Alcoholics Anonymous. Great program. Why? Because it has a spiritual component. It has the buddy system. Higher power. That's, and high, that's exactly right. They know better. It's kind of like us in our sinful nature. How many of you think your sinful nature disappears when you're converted? 
You find that out about 15 minutes after you were baptized, right? So, and I thought that when I got well, and now that I'm, I guess I'll just start acting normal. Right, acting normal is the right answer. But I didn't, I didn't change so much. I'm trying to think. Yeah, people, some people have a guilt complex because they didn't have a conversion like Paul. Have any of you had that? You, you can't, can you remember the date and the time you were converted? There's many people that can't. Probably raised in a Christian home. You know, you've, your parents were God-fearing people. And so you were raised this way and that way. And one of those days, you accepted Christ as your personal Savior. It might have been in, a, in an academy. It might have been in, who knows what the setting was. But you can't remember the exact day and time. It's not even that important. The point is, did you accept? Did you take his gift for what it says? He gives you the gift. He gives you salvation. He gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit. Everybody agree with that? The Holy Spirit comes at conversion. That's part of the conversion process, right? Repentance is another gift that comes at conversion, right? So we go through all of that, and uh, in return, he takes our sins. Sounds like a bad deal to him, to me. Not for us, but for him. But he knew that we needed to have basically a, a conscience that said, you're innocent. But our flesh tells us that we're not. And that's the battle we have all through life. That's why we have doubts sometimes. How many of you have doubts about your salvation at times? I do. Come on, Ron, you're cheating. Okay. What was the key to his answer? He said something there. Pardon? Faith. Faith. Association. Okay, we're going to talk about that. If you look at the text here, okay, it appears that because I sin, God's now separated and they can't talk to him. He's at a distance. That's the way the text appears, does it not? Because you have iniquities, I'm separated from you. But that's not the real issue. Iniquity is, but with Ron's alcoholism, if you and I have sin in our life, sometimes I've got sin in my life, you know, well, I enjoy it. Well, then be honest with God and tell him you do. Go to the throne of grace. If you say, Lord, you know what? I know this isn't the right thing, but I, have, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I even have a desire for it. God knows that. Even when Moses laid there, you know, he said he... Put away the joys, some translations put, of sin for a short season. Sin can be enjoyable for a short season. There's no doubt about it, and so forth. But he says, you know what? I'll help you with that desire. If you really want me to intervene for you, if you really want me to do it, I'll do it. I'll take that by the way. But we better be persistent in prayer about that issue, don't you think? He's just asking you to open the door, right? Association. So uh, we're going to talk about a couple of examples about how we think iniquity basically puts God at a distance when it really doesn't. God will give some good examples of that. All right, let's go on. Oh, what do we got here in the bushes? <laughs> What's an example that when they sinned, we separated, God didn't? Who are we talking about? Adam and Eve, right? They're in the worship song. Where are you? God is looking for them. Right? Where are you? So then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called them, where in the world are you? He knew where they were at. Right? Where are you? Why is it? Now here's a question you don't have to answer, but I want you to think about it. Because everything I'm telling you, I'm talking about my own experience. So, is uh, we've done something we shouldn't have done, and so I don't want to pray that night. Have you ever been in that boat? There you go. Okay, and we, we need to talk about it because, you know, there might be people who have a guilt complex because, now listen, it happens. We separate from God. Because we know what he wants and we don't want to come to the throne of grace because we're ashamed. Or maybe it's something else. Or maybe it's a desire. I still like it. 
I know I was working with some teenagers, you know. Teenagers and college students are great in, 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 uh, in Sabbath school because they ask questions that most of us won't ask. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes we don't have any answers. But they're very, very upfront about issues. And that's a good thing. And I think sometimes as a church, and even in Sabbath school, I'm a very believe, big believer in small groups. And the reason is, in a small group, people can be more upfront. They can be more honest. We can keep an eye on one another to see if somebody, you know, is going one way or the other. We're friends and so forth. If we did more small groups, we have, would have less attrition. Do you agree with that? Okay. We need that. But it's hard to get people into small groups. What do you think, Dan? I know you're molding that over in your mind. No comment? Make a note of that in a minute. Would you? Yeah. <laughs> So, this idea of separation is, if I've got an alcoholism, if I've got a sin issue in my life, I've got something I can't, over, I'm struggling with and so forth, what God is saying, I want you to come boldly to the throne of grace, because any man that cometh unto me, I will in what? No wise cast out. All God's asking is to come in with whatever you've got. It's when we don't approach him with a sin problem, he can't help us. Not right? And so forth. So if we could teach that to new converts. You know, Kayla and I gave a Bible study to a couple. I was a lot, she was single, that's right. She was, I think she was divorced. And uh, she had a terrible smoking habit. Now, you know, pride's worse than smoking ever will be. I don't think you can get cancer from pride, but you certainly, uh, you know. But the issue is we put her into a five-day plan and so forth. She stopped smoking. And then about three weeks later, I didn't see her in church. So we called her, and she said, oh, I, I didn't feel real well. Didn't come the next Sabbath. Called her again. So finally, the third Sabbath, she comes, and she comes up, and she said, I, I can't attend church anymore. I said, well, why not? She says, I start smoking again. Now, we smile at that, but a lot of people are not in this church today because they have an issue, and maybe it is their sin, but they were never taught how to deal with that. They had the same attitude that we see that we read just a few slides back. God doesn't, you know, he's looking for any legal way to, th way to throw us out. He's not like my dad who would kick me out of the house if I made a mistake or didn't mop a floor right. You learn that, hey, if you got this issue, son or daughter, go to the throne of grace. Well, I still enjoy doing it. That's okay. You go to the throne of grace and you tell God that. Don't you think that his desire for you is to get over that issue? All he's waiting is for your permission and your perseverance in prayer to show that you really mean it. If God is going to basically use choice in his whole universe and risk sin, he needs to make sure that's exactly what we want to do. And sometimes young people and us as adults, we think desire, if it's there, means we don't mean it. Doesn't mean it at all. Our feelings don't mean anything. It's principle that means everything. Isn't that true? We're not saved by feelings. We can tell all kinds of stories about that. So forth. So, okay. So we can come to the throne of grace and say hallelujah. I've got sin in my life, but I'm taking it to Jesus. And I'm going to persevere with that until I see action. Because God needs to know, is it all right? Is it all right? And the more we get close to him, then. Ron, you have a comment there. later, as we all know, people who have converted in the Seventh-day Adventist faith know that Satan turns up the burners that he once had me easily, just the smallest little yeah. temptation. I was always a part of his plan. Yep. But as a Christian, along with Jesus Christ, Satan says, no, 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 I want you back. You belong here. So you get that in your head, too. Yes, you do. 
Yes. And then a very dear friend presented me a book. It wasn't my first Ellen um, White book or first Hofstra book. It was the second. And it was called Steps to Christ. Mm -hmm. The greatest book ever written on the righteous by faith, short of scripture dogma. But I was reminded and shown that the Ethiopian and not Sam Ethiopian or the lepers of Bob. <coughs> smoking cigarettes there or drinking whatever else. Yes. And um, he was, as you alluded to, wanting to give us the strength, the power, the grace to work in our lives. To deal with these things, but always come back. We're all in the hospital together. We're all sinners. That's right. And we're all needing to be treated. As one guy said to me, he said, I don't go to church. He said, you know, people, you know, you say one thing, do another. I said, well, it's a good thing you're in church, wouldn't you think? Go to a hospital, do we expect to see well people? These are people healed because they know they got a problem, right? And they're still working on it with God and be faithful. And when people say, well, yeah, but look at them. Well, yes, I'll tell you something. Do you think about the disciples? Do you know how many times they argue about who's the greatest? In fact, they got a few feet away to see if Jesus wouldn't heal. Are you kidding me? <laughs> we do that, don't we? God's not watching. <laughs> and how did Jesus deal with that? Tenderly? Did he throw them out the window? They were no longer fit to be my disciples. No, he did not. And what I love about the gospel is that Peter, some people think that when Peter sinned, that he was not already saved. That's not true. The Bible says that they had the Lord's Supper. And they were too proud to wash Jesus' feet. And even though it was normal for the host to do that, you would think he could easily use that excuse, but then I guess most of them felt they weren't hosts. So Jesus goes around and he starts washing their feet and he comes to Peter. And as Peter would do, you're not washing my feet. Not gonna happen. And Jesus says to him, unless, <laughs> you wanna finish it, Ron? Yeah, unless I wash your feet, you will have no part with me. And Peter said, well, I can't have that. <laughs> Give me a bath. Now, here is the answer that should remain in your mind. You don't need a bath. You are already what? Clean. You know, it's not possible. He's arguing, yeah, he's probably part of the argument, who's the greatest. He denied his Lord. And you know how we know he was saved even after he did that? I want you to look at two examples of true repentance, evil repentance, and godly repentance. Judas did evil repentance. What did he do? Did he go to the throne of grace? He killed himself. What did Peter do? He wept because he'd hurt a friend. And the reason that Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Jesus didn't need to hear that. He already knew. But Peter needed to hear it for himself. He needed that for the confidence he could continue to have in Jesus. What a wonderful story, isn't it? It's a beautiful story. It'll help us in our faith that we don't want to get down if we're not living up to what we need to live up to. I encourage people to come to the throne of grace and persevere. Mark. Yeah, it's God's love that ultimately will help us to love. And when we love, we will obey for the right reasons. Is that true? Okay. Let's go on. Now, this comes from Faith and Works, Mellon White. 
And we want to just break this down a little bit. I don't care if we get through the whole lesson or not. I think there's so many good points in this. We want to make sure we cover them we can. Let's take it a sentence at a time. She goes on. She says this. We must learn in the school of Christ. Now let's look at the second sentence. Nothing but his righteousness can entitle us to one of the blessings of the covenant of grace. I think that's a lesson that is hard learned. For me, maybe for the rest of us. It's great, it's wonderful, but trying to apply it to ourselves, it's difficult sometimes, right? Um, when uh, we were attending Evangelical United Brethren Church, they would have uh, every sermon there was a call. Every sermon there was a call. There were testimony services often. And the nice thing about testimony services is you're not there bragging about yourself. The Bible says it's okay to boast about God. They would stand, and most of the testimonies I heard, they, all they talked about was what Jesus had done for them. That is our testimony, okay? And so forth. But I, I was just a teenager, and I was still, you know, well, how old was I? I was dating her. You know, it is true that you can be married at 19 years old and still have 60-some years, almost 60 years of marriage. It does happen at times. So mothers, if you're concerned about your son or fathers, your daughters, and she's only 18, it is possible. <laughs> it can happen. <laughs> it's so forth. But anyway, I just interrupted my thought, my uh, term of thought here. What was I talking about? <laughs> what was that? So you're still Twitter baited, aren't you? Yeah, I am. I am. I am. Well, it's, uh, it's, I usually say I got, if, I, if I heard it within two weeks, I can remember it, but well, obviously it doesn't apply. Does anybody remember what I was saying? <laughs> Oh, oh, thank you, Ron. You see, you, you did come for a reason, right? By the way, uh, the, we have some visitors. We've got Mike. Oh, boy, I don't know. Why did I remember your husband? Hold on, just give it a couple of seconds. It's, it's rotating right now. What was it? Felicia. See, I should have had that one. Now, I'm, I was going to call Ron and the Shadow, right? That's, easy for that's, you. A, that's the problem with name a month ago, right? So that's the problem with name association. And it can be get dangerous to use that, you know, especially if you use the wrong term. All right, let's go on this. It says, we must learn that. How do you learn to accept Christ's righteousness? That's a tough one. What do you think? Yep. Yep. Uh, I, I, I use this very simple. I don't like using sports analogies. I hate it. It's all right. I love sports. But, but um, <laughs> yeah, I grew up on it too. Yeah. Yeah. It was religion to me. That's the problem. Um, um, but kay. you know, Jesus batted a thousand. He compared to him. The first time I strike out, we're done. Yeah. And his standard. Self-righteousness, as our brother shared. Yeah. Rely on me. Open that door. Allow the Holy Spirit to yeah. your mind and heart. I give you grace and strength to help us in time of need. Give you force of speech. That's a tough um, <coughs> process for me over the years. Uh, most of us. All of us, probably. That is a process, though. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have grace or peace with God, and so forth. And that's what God wants us to have, is a peace and our relationship with him that can only happen if we accept the basics of conversion, which is his power as the Holy Spirit to offset the carnal nature, okay? Number two, that he gives us repentance. We feel bad about what we've done because of his gifts. And number three is he forgives. When God forgives, he forgives, and he forgets, okay? And number four, he wants us to forget. What do you think he thinks when we doubt his gift? Is that, a, is that, are we really commandment keepers if we doubt his gift? Sometimes you think commandment keeping is the Ten Commandments. Oh, it's much more than that. 
but way beyond that. It is the principles of love. And when we give his gift back, and that's exactly what we're doing when we don't accept it, because I'm not good enough. Of course you're not good enough. That's why we have the gift, right? And so forth. We've used this term too much. There is presumption. But some people think if they say, I have a saving relationship with Jesus, that that's presumptuous. It's not presumptuous. If that's what the word says, that's good enough, right? I don't care what some other author said. If the Bible says that's what it is, that's what it is. Because I think we're all true what? Everybody going to finish it? <laughs> Where am I going, right? We are all true Protestants. The Bible and the what? All doctrine. All proof of anything and everything comes from one source, the scriptures. So I would ask you, where do you think you should be spending your time? In the Word, right. Okay, let's go on here. The grace of Christ is our only hope of salvation. So when people are scared of the judgment, all God is concerned about is that we separate from him. That we stop seeing him. You know, we've used this before in John 6, 28 and 29. There were some Jews that had an understanding that something was missing in their religion. So here was the question they came to Jesus with. What work, work over here, what, what we must do, what work can we do that we can do the works of God? What, how many types of works we got here? Two. <laughs> Verse 29. What was Jesus' answer? Anybody put, NIV puts it this way. Uh, New Living Bible puts it this way. The others, all the most translations put it really nice. Right? The work that you must do. Remember he said we're judged by our works? The work that you must do. This is what he's talking about. The work that you must do is to know the one whom the Father has sent. Where did he repeat that? John 17, 3. That knowing God is having eternal life. Right? Why were the five virgins not allowed in after the bridegroom would come? I'm sorry, I don't know you. Yeah, Mark. Yes, he does. It was intimate. There was an intimate yeah. connection. More than just, oh yeah, I know that person. No, he knew that person. He didn't know that person. Something like that. I had a uh, uncle. I didn't like my uncle very well. He was kind of harsh, I thought, and so forth. And I knew him, but I didn't love him. I knew my dad, but I loved him. What was the difference? What was the difference? Because in my, gut, my dad, I saw his love for me. And I did not see that in my uncle. Does that help? So when we take a look at that, yes, you can know, as a, but the devil doesn't love. For somehow, some way, I think at one time Lucifer had a love for God. That's why I don't believe in once saved, always saved. Once saved, always saved takes the what out of the equation? Choice. That's the problem with that doctrine. Sounds nice, but it takes choice. So if we make a decision down the road, God will never make a decision against us. All right? And we decide, and how do we decide that we don't want it? We don't just get up and say, I oh, forget eternal life, I don't want it. We don't say that. First of all, we probably stop gathering together, number one. Number two, we stop sliding or studying the word. Number three, we stop praying, because as we talked about before, we don't pray because we may know we have an issue, but we don't want to take it to God. And so we start putting those things together. Ultimately, the carnal nature will take over again because it is still there. Right? Does that pretty much add to it? What do you think? Would you add to the list here? We do not want attrition in our church. 
and I have, I'm thinking myself, not you, is that I need to be more considerate and more concerned about people are not here. I mean, sometimes I don't know all their names, and uh, sometimes uh, at my age, it's understandable. But uh, the thing is, is that we need to be more concerned. How can we do that? We talked about being small groups in our church. You know, you don't have to do it on Wednesday night. You could have small groups in Sabbath school. And you limit the number so that you can form intimacy and so forth. But you know what? All of us are going to have to be involved for that to happen. It just isn't going to happen. We live in a day where people don't go to church, millennials especially. If you go to Europe, most people don't attend church. They say they're Christians, but they don't attend church. They don't gather together. We have seen the results of what happens when you stop relationships over the last year. What have we seen? Horrible things, right? Child abuse has increased dramatically. Divorce. I mean, I can go right down the list with relationship issues. Suicides. So anyway, kind of like why what God is trying to tell us in Isaiah. Don't give up coming to me. That is the worst thing you can do. I don't care what you've done, right? All right, let's go on. Now, let's go over what it means to be a Christian through the life of Jesus. Yes, over here. Sure. Okay. So to me, that's saying that the true you is that I'm sincere, not that I'm fake, but I'm sincere and I'm watching and weighing and challenging people. Okay. Let's look at it from a biblical perspective. Okay. Jesus is washing their feet. When he says you'll have no part from me, he's not just talking about sincerity. What is he talking about? When he says to you, you have no part with me, what is he saying? He's saying, that's it. He's saying, if we don't have part with Jesus, we're not saved, and we're not going to be saved in the kingdom. It's that simple. And he was telling Peter that exact thing. That's from a biblical perspective. And when he told Peter, you don't need a bath. What does a bath symbolize when we are converted? Baptism. What does baptism symbolize? Being born again and living and coming out in a new life. Is that true? But, but dying first. Yes. Well, that's the end of the water. Yeah. Okay. You <laughs> oh, you've got to have that. But that's part of the conversion process, isn't it? Okay. I want to come back to her question. I appreciate your, your response. But this is a very critical issue. Because when we look at Peter and we see what he's done, we've seen ourselves in that situation. Peter was not sinless. He was dependent on himself for just about everything. When he pulled that sword out and cut off the ear of the high priest ear, he took his life into his hands doing that. And you and I would look at that and say, that's pretty brave. But Jesus said, those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. And so what Jesus was talking to Peter is, you know what? Salvation doesn't come in dependence on yourself. He was talking about Peter's sanctification and his the very basic thing you are already clean now if you go back and you look I'll give you some sources the translation and every just about every translation you read today is clean and in order for you and I to be saved we have to be perfect that's what the Bible says if you're not perfect you will not be in the kingdom of heaven that's why we have a savior he is perfect so what he was telling Peter, and I think this helped him when he denied his Lord. He remembered those words and so forth. When we think we're separated from God because of a sin, or we think because we're not perfect that we can't go to him, that we can't trust him in salvation, even when you make a mistake, you will not be a very happy person. We've got to believe just like in a family. 
that if we fall and slip, it's part of growing, isn't it? We expect it out of our kids. You think Jesus expects anything less. And so we grow from that perspective. That's a very important text because it talks about the very essence of God and how he deals with sinners. Peter was telling him, you don't need to wash me. Jesus, I'll tell you right now, you need my washing. You need my cleansing. But I'm telling you, legally, you're already righteous. What a wonderful message. I tell you, I live and die on those texts. But thank you very much. You may look at it a little differently, and that's okay. That's fine. That's what we have Sabbath school for. Yeah. That's right. And yeah. then going back to, to um, sincerity, um, you have that sanctification process, which is like Paul says, I die daily. daily. It, mm-hmm. it is an ongoing cleansing, and it's, it's a cooperation between you and God, you acknowledging your weakness and inability, and turning on to God that will enable us to make the right thing and to restore to the right thing. And yeah. See, I think when you, make your, when you made your comment about I die daily, what was Paul really saying? He's saying he's staying attached to God every day. Isn't that right? Every day I'm taking time with God. Okay? Because it is possible, as we're told in the, in the book of John, that the branch can be broken off. Okay? Not because God wants it broken off, but because we choose to break it off. Right? Yeah. We all have liabilities. Yeah. No. <laughs> when God created, you know, Illinois and Indiana, he says, I'm going to you know, balance out Southwest Berkeley. We created Southwest Michigan. But anyway, so there's cornfields all over the place, right? And when a person goes and plants corn, a few weeks or a few days later, whatever, a week later, he comes out and he sees a little Oops. sprout. And he says, it's perfect. He yeah. comes out. Yeah, good point. And Tim, talking about maturity, Mark makes the two points to that. There is. When it comes to being saved, your record better be perfect. But whose record is reviewed? Jesus is. God looks at Jesus, what he did on the cross, to cover your sin. I'm gonna come, just a second. I'll come. Oh, well, go ahead. Maybe it's a good time. Go ahead. Okay, first of all, I take the Bible over anybody, including Ellen White. That's number one. Number two, 
is the situation she's saying is that the washing itself externally did nothing. Jesus was talking spiritually, not externally. So the washing of his feet didn't mean anything from that perspective, but it was symbolic. When you and I celebrate communion, it isn't just from what we've heard that, well, it's to make things right with somebody. Well, that's a good time to do it. It's basically a mini baptism. It is a reflection of what God has done for you in your good times and your bad. That he's constantly washing the sin from our life. That is the example of Peter's situation. And that has helped me more in my Christian life than probably anything else. Before I'll tell you, when I first became an Adventist, I was a legalist in and out. Our Sabbaths were horrible. I was so rigid about what we didn't and do. I was an externalist. And so I basically, that's what, how I applied my life. My kids hated the Sabbath, and you know what? So did I. Up front, I said, it's, you know, it's okay, it's good. But they hated it. And fortunately, to my good wife, from her previous faith, help me to understand what it means to have salvation by faith. And not that we don't teach that in the Adventist Church, we do, but if you know the history of our church, and this is true of many denominations, we got to a point where we were legalists. Ellen White even made a statement, you know, the law is, how did she say that? The law is, is not, there you go, thank you, and so forth. I wouldn't be in the church if we hadn't had that. When it comes to the gospel, there is no compromise. When you see the irritation of Paul, when it comes to the gospel, of people trying to change it for what it means, Paul was not gentle. He was angry because it deprives people of righteousness and so forth. It is something we cannot, we cannot put aside. It is critical and so forth. And if we can do that, we will bring people back into the church, not away from the church. We're people who are alive and willing to give their testimony and say, I know what Jesus has done for me, and so forth. So the thing that Isaiah is saying here is, you know, sin's an issue. Let's go over these three points real quick. This is talking about the servant. You know, Isaiah talks about that, and that was Christ. Let's go over each point. Do we have time? No. We don't have time. So if you get a chance, read Isaiah 50, and go from verses four through six, okay? And if you'll go through that, and it gives three points that Jesus did that made his life a success, and it seems that if we can adopt that through God's power, we can do that. Do we have any other comments? Dear, thank you so much for your comments. I hope I wasn't sound harsh. I did not mean to be, okay? And so forth. Thank you for being here. That's what Sabbath school is all about, all right? Okay. Uh, any other comments? All right, let's bow our heads. Oh, did you have one, Mike? No? Lisa, I just want you to know that I do remember it the second time around. Okay, good to have you with us. I don't know your folks' name. I should, I suppose, right? I'll do that afterward, okay? Let's bow our heads. Father, we give thanks again for Jesus and his love. Where would we be without it? And uh, we pray for myself as well as for everyone here, our church body, that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit. That number one is we will know where we stand with regard to eternal life. And number two, that because of your power and as we grow in love, we will be a commandment keepers. We will be, but we exercise that by people who say, well, we know that we love God and we follow him because of it. We give thanks for all the gifts you provided. Thanks for the opportunity to have the freedom to have this class today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much.